time for our panel discussion on uh, creativity in finance management and administration. Now joining us, in fact, our uh, set of speakers and our panelists are so renowned that they absolutely need no introduction, but I'm definitely going to take a minute to introduce our session moderator, who for the past two decades has been at the forefront of the design industry. In fact, at the onset of his career with contracting jobs and executing projects, the turning point of the life came while working with an Italian design firm as an importer that gave him abundance of experience and the real understanding of designing. He's somebody who comes with a vibrant vision, a zest for innovation, and also a commitment for sustainability. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have with us none other than Jimmy Mystery. So please put your hands together for the one and only designer, hotelier, adventurer, and developer, Jimmy Mystery, Della Group, Mumbai. Well, such a delight indeed to have Jimmy on board uh, to moderate this fantastic panel discussion. Well, joining him on the panel, we have with us such stellar set of speakers. First up, may we please invite Anupam Bansal of ABRD Architects, New Delhi. Please put your hands together, ladies and gentlemen, for Anupam Bansal. Well, moving on, our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, we have with us none other than Mr. V. Suresh, Indian Green Building Council, Mumbai. May we also invite Abin Alam Chandani of the STUP Design Forum, Mumbai. And our final speaker, who is also conferred with the Entrepreneur of the Year Award by SRCC and Yes Bank, we have with us Lipika Sood of Lipika Sood Interiors Private Limited, New Delhi. You know, we're talking about the monies over here. It's the finance management and administration when it comes to creativity. So on that note, let's get this session started. I'm going to hand over the proceedings to Jimmy. And with that, over to you, sir. Good afternoon. And would love to start this session with offering our respect to somebody who was a legend in our world, in the world of engineering in India, Dr. PC Jain. He passed away day before yesterday. And I think we all can just stand up and give him a moment of respect in silence. He was truly, truly a legend. He was the chairman of Spectral, one of the largest engineering consulting firms in the country. He was, he was chairman of Indian Green Building Council. The list is endless. And at the age of 84, he was the oldest teaching faculty member across India. The amount this man has contributed, I think you guys should read up about him. We, we bow in our heads for him and give him a moment of respect. I thank you. Please sit. So we begin today's day by discussing a subject which, which, is, which is truly unspoken, usually never on a public forum. Uh, commercialization and uh, creative people are, who run their own practices are all entrepreneurs in their own rights be it small practices, be it large organizations. But how successful are they in applying their creativity to financial management, administrative management, HR, human resource, and hence able to scale up their practices? If yes, why? If not, why? We try and scratch beneath the surface. So there is, there is something for each and every one of you to take back who are prospective budding entrepreneurs sitting here. So let me begin with yet another legend who's sitting here. Uh, Mr. Suresh, I would love to begin with you by asking you, what do you think is plaguing a country? Why, why, are, why are design creative entrepreneurs who do so well? Yes, sir? Hello? Yeah, you can use this. So with your years and years of experience, why do you think our design creative entrepreneurs who are very good designers, but not able to scale up their design practices? I think, uh, Jimmy, it's a very important point you have raised. I've been in the sector for the last 52 years, the built environment sector. Uh, architecture as a pure profession, in all its purity is one aspect, 
but the growth level in that particular thing can only happen when you're able to go beyond pure architecture and creation of the three-dimensional space, not only the building and also the built environment, you know, a larger amount of related areas which are encompassing the final creation of that particular one at the level of neighborhood or at the level of uh, layout or at the level of a building in all its corporate. It's a multidisciplinary area coming with all those people, uh, be the engineer, the structural engineer, MEPF, uh, all those people are there. It's very necessary that architectural profession should be able to go beyond that and embrace and just not leave only at the aesthetical, functional planning space alone into a very large. They've got to get into it. The, where will the growth has happened of leading architectural companies all over the world? Any any one of the big ones, if you see, you'll understand. In many of those cases, they got a very nice multidisciplinary team component instead of just outsourcing for little level a structural engineer or an MEP of person for a small little job. That's one area which I can tell. The second area which I can uh, tell where the growth has happened. Otherwise, you'll continue to have four or five architects or young architects do one or two projects here. You'll have some growth, marginally growing. But if you want to have the type of growth of a corporate growth to take place as a good amount of, like, a, like a, uh, if you want to have like a Spectral or an AECOM or you want to get like Duron or various other big leading architectural firm with uh, phenomenal multidisciplinary capabilities on that. You've got to go beyond that. And number two, a lot of new layers have come into that. And again, the profession has got to get into it. That's why big money is there. Otherwise, in terms of the scale of fees and all, you might get around two, two and a half or three percent. Of course, interior designer map will get around 10 percent maybe. But the big amount is coming in the project management, in the quality assessment, and the execution of the project. You get into a big area. So if you're able to have the professional uh, capability of the architects to go beyond just drawing of, a, uh, of, of the conceptual creation of a, a project alone, but you get into a larger area, that's where the, and the companies will also grow if you're able to have within that. And now, new layers are going. Just now, remember Dr. P.C. Jain, uh, who's an outstanding uh, uh, professional by himself, and he's, he brought in the sustainability chapter in the National Building Code. Sustainable development is a new uh, buzzword, but in it, water management, waste management, energy management, everything comes. Equally important for passive and active design for architecture. So green building movement is a very major one. Many architects have gone into, as accredited professionals, beyond their capability as a pure architect, into accredited professionals in the field of green building movement in a very large way. That doesn't end there. Another major area where people are making good money, not architects, are people dealing with the assets and facility management. Big growth, phenomenal. And let me tell you, and that's an area where we all end up think the building is completed, completion certificate, occupant certificate, architect gone, engineer gone, builder gone. But the assets and facility managers come over there to keep the performance of the building one year down the line, 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line, 30 years down the line, to keep how things are going. And now, if you are able to have in those particular days, there are many good architectural firms, uh, especially in uh, uh, in Singapore, as well as in UK, as well as in USA and Canada, where they also have the facility management capability. And you want to integrate that with design. It is not somebody to come and clean up of the firefighting system going or lift going up, etc. So what I'm trying to say is that just go beyond your particular area if you want growth to be looked after. While builders, developers have phenomenal growth of 10 times, 20 times growth of their bottom line of annual operations. Most of the very less, we should have a top 20 architectural firm with multidisciplinary capability. I'm not only the big five or big four like uh, consultants or uh, CAs or other one, but at least we should have the capability being built over there. Make it corporatized a little more, make it corporatized a little more, uh, get the, uh, and good team should be there. The financial management is a very important component because new building materials, technologies coming, if you just had opportunity to hear uh, from various groups, etc. A very intensive knowledge of those particular things and including on project management and implementation capability. If you are able to do that, the growth will happen. Otherwise, you continue to have 
business as usual, maybe a one more project or two more projects, each one cross-cutting yourself and bringing down from the high level. That's also another thing. Professional fees is also a very major thing. The profession has got a stand-up, like the chartered accountants are doing, lawyers are doing, the fees that you'll have. We are, we are, the profession is undercutting. Upper interior design is another layer. That's on my next list to discuss about the fees. But before we do that, uh, Lipika, we have a very special woman over here. With, uh, with a mixture of design and law. I, she graduated as a lawyer, if I, if I know it correctly. Passed and, out from SRCC first. Right, and then she got into design and design implementation, manufacturing. So pretty interesting career path and growth you had. And you've seen them all through the last 25, 28 years that you've been practicing. Why don't you share your knowledge as to why do you think Indian design practices, architects, designers, are not able to scale up and ramp up their business models? Uh, see, thanks, uh, Jimmy. I think that's a very interesting question. A lot of people uh, still ask me why, after passing out from SRCC and doing law and then a management course in the Institute of Mass Communications and all of that, how am I uh, an interior designer? Purely passion. Good marks happened in the 12th standards. <laughs> so, by default, because I was a commerce student, got admission in SRCC. Everybody at that point of time, three decades ago, thought that was the best thing to do. I was always creatively inclined. The design, the art, the beauty of things, to create things was always, always something that I was directing towards. So anyhow, I don't want to go back into what and how it happened. Uh, I simply just picked up my bag one day from a corporate uh, job. Uh, which was with the Tatas, and uh, I decided to do a course in interior design. And there it was, I was uh, studying interior for, an art for, a, for, for some time at the Rodeck University, and then I started my own business of interior design. Now, this is where I must tell you guys that how my practice was different from the way uh, usually people who pass out from architectural schools and colleges or interior design schools and colleges was. I started with a private limited company because I understood that to do and run an enterprise it is important to have a private limited company because it has a certain standard and it is recognized in a certain way. Now architectural firms probably do not, uh, uh, cannot become a private limited company but they can also work in a very corporatized manner. Now the whole idea was and as I practiced through the years I, dis I discovered that most designers, most creative people have this huge issue of the left brain and the right brain, you know. We need the creative brain vis-a-vis -vis the uh, analytical brain. Now, the, uh, the most creative people are very, very close, including myself, about things to do with finance, things to do with admin. If you have to look at a balance sheet, oh my God, those ugly figures. So, how do you grow your business? And the, the, the biggest thing I found, um, uh, guys, is that there's no... Uh, uh, at, at least that point of time, even now, entrepreneurship, finance management, marketing, brand management are not part of any, any, any design school's curriculum, which is actually a very, very, very important part of being able to be successful in the design business or a design practice, be it an architect, an interior designer, a product designer, a graphic designer. It is absolutely essential without which there is absolutely no way of succeeding at the pace that you need to succeed. But it's not being recognized, it's not being understood. So if you realize a lot of the design uh, professionals or the successful brands that have made their name and their mark and their money like Jimmy have actually had a very huge financial you know, uh, inclination towards understanding money, understanding finance, I'm understanding sure understand. how to be able to invest it, how to make profits. Trust me guys, profits is not a negative term. It's actually the most important thing to do, whether you're in the practice of design or whether you're in the, in the, in the business of selling products. Profit is what makes the world go round. It's all about money and that's it. So you can be a creative person and say, oh, it doesn't matter to me if I'm not making money. It doesn't matter to me if I'm being only appreciated for the creative that I am doing and the joy of creating something and for all the nirmal anand that we get for doing all those beautiful things. But the money does matter. And if you guys are all honest, it is so important for you to be able to successfully 
go to the next level and the next level and the next level only when your stomach is full, your cup is full and it's flowing over and you're able to attract the right professionals to help you with your profession so that it grows and it grows in a very positive manner. I think you're kept to be time to creativity. So thank you. Lepika, I think you've got it right. Uh, what is, what is, what is uh, also very important, like a couple of things she said, people are not exposed to financial management, people are not exposed to management within the world of design curriculum. They're not even exposed to presentation skill set. So there are a lot of things that we require. Uh, next person to speak and whom I would like to pick on his brains is again very special, Abhil from Stoop Consultants. He's again a super achiever. He has not only proven that a design practice can be scaled up, but he has parallelly got a huge engineering firm employing about 2,000 people. So here you have a man who can share his knowledge not only about why design is not scalable and why engineering is scalable. There are too many issues to it. And I would love that he should highlight off some of the issues and his learnings, what has made him a super achiever and scale up to 2,000 employees, and why the design practice could not be scaled beyond where it is today. Abil. Thank you very much. So, uh, you know, before coming here, I was wondering why I wasn't asked to speak about my design. And then when I looked at the subject and I said, hey, perhaps, you know, I can contribute a little bit more by actually talking to you about the structure of a business, which is at the heart of the subject. You know, if you look at India, the entire concept of the Council of Architects is that architecture should be practiced as a profession, not as a business. You know, it, root it is, cause it is, of the problem. The, 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 the structure of our very profession is that. Now, I am not going to get down to whether that is right or wrong. I am going to show you through a live example. So, I work with Charles Korea, Joseph Allenstein, Bal Krishna Doshi. You know, before I moved out of India, I had the most. I would say the brilliant education in professional practice. In fact, I did design my first house with Lori Baker. So wow. I really had a great start, you know, as an, as an architect. But you know, I always thought that, you know, what am I going to do with my career? You know, all I wanted to do in the beginning was make three good buildings. If anybody asked me, what do you want to achieve? I said, I want to design three things that I'm proud of, you know, across my life. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, I was moving the mic. So I said, Okay, three things that I'm proud of. But as things evolved, I went to France, I started working there, and then I came back to India. My thought process changed. I realized that as an architect, I'm now trying to relate to what you do and what architects do, and why you should actually have this financial thinking. You see, the problem was when I, when I was working with Mrs. Stein, and you know, you see the India International Center, and then you see the India Habitat Center, okay? And you notice that Mr. Stein used to keep telling me that after so many years, he felt disappointed with the profession. The reason why he felt disappointed was that he was not able to execute his vision as well in 1990 as he was in 1967. He seemed to be losing control of his business because there were so many other stakeholders, the builder, the contractor, the you know, MEP consultant, etc. So although Mr. Stein had an office which had MEP, structure, architecture, all within one house, he was just not able to scale and intervene the way a Norman Foster, who had 800 people in his office, was able to do. Now, when I came down to India, the big question in my head was that why don't I, if I really want to deliver something innovative and build something creative, those three great buildings, why can't I have a practice where I've got good engineers, good architects, good uh, project managers, all sitting across one table, right, and designing the project as a first shot to the client. So when an architect gives a scheme, then the engineer tells him, hey, I can't do this well. Or the project manager says, but this can't be executed within this timeline. Or the contractor says, contractually something has been left out and I can't execute it. So if you are making a commitment to a client, it's not your beautiful design that's the commitment, it's how you plan, program, and conceive the entire project in all its aspects. So how do you do that? So what I did is, instead of practicing as an individual architect, I joined an engineering firm, okay, which was run by the French, and my father was an engineer, was a part of it. Okay, he was like the manager of the chairman and manager of it. 
I joined that firm and started an architectural department under an engineering firm. Amazingly, I found that the Council of Architects objected to that. So I was wondering why would the Council of Architects object to an architect running a 2,000 man multidisciplinary firm? What's wrong with that? You know, it's a big question in my head. It so happened that it, because of the kind of practice there was in India, I had to start a separate architectural practice besides this engineering practice to be in conformity with India. So I happened to be the, one of the only people who had an individual architectural practice and who also was running the largest multidisciplinary practice that India had produced. This is, this is just my story and my journey starts actually from the structure of this business which I believe must tell me the Council of Architects says that architecture should only be a profession. When you're scaling up your business, you scale up your business. My company, Stoop Consultants, started as a five-man company. Today, it's a 2,000-man company. In, nine, in 2008, when the financial markets collapsed, from 2008 to 2018, it has grown threefold. It has gone into the fields of railways, metros, you know, for example, as an architect, I'm designing 70 underground and elevated metro, metro stations at one time. I'm doing eight airport terminal buildings at the same time, all through the same engine. It's the canvas that you can create yourself. Now, with the way we are structured, the profession is structured in India, because you're not allowed to have a private limited company, okay, your liabilities are fully exposed. No client wants to give the architecture component of the business to an architect because he is a professional. What is his, you know, if company, what is his financial standing? If you sue him, right? What's going to happen? It's a twenty-five thousand crore project, an airport, I mean Mumbai airport. You know, so I happen to be working as the as the Indian architect. Daha Hadid is the international architect. But imagine if something goes wrong, right? Uh, if I'm not a private limited company, I'm destroyed. The client is sunk. So basically, the client wants you to be able to take out indemnity insurances, etc., etc., so that he is covered. After all, he's taking money from banks and institutions. So I think that the Council of Architects, the Architects Act of 1972, should actually, you know, take into account such things. Now, when the company grew, I realized that I need to have HR. I have all of these 2,000 people. I have 200 people leaving every year. Another 200 people joining every year. So I need to develop a full-scale HR system in my company. If I was a, you know, if I was an architect uh, for the Council of Architects, an HR person could not be in my board because they allow only architects to be in the board or to be the owners of the company. Now that's really unfair. How do you attract professionals? How do you attract a management expert, a finance expert, and a legal expert into your firm? You are not allowed. You are not able to. So basically, I learned that if uh, you know, and to be an architectural practice right in India, I think we've got to consider a lot of these things and I think we've got to actually make a lot of structural changes in the environment and do it together to enable it to happen. I'm fortunate that I could do it because I had an engineering company through which I could deliver certain services which were multidisciplinary and so marry these two things together. Just, just a small bit of my journey. Thank you. I think it was fantastic. Guys, he deserves a round of applause. Come on, what a super achiever, taking out time to share his knowledge and coming straight from the heart. We have my fourth panelist before I express my point of view and opinion on it. I have Anupam Bansal, again, a super achiever architect, doing some fantastic institutional work, hospitality work. Anupam, three of our other panelists have expressed their opinion as to why design practices find it so difficult to ramp up and scale up. What are your views? What is at the core? What is at the core of the entire problem? Why are design practices not able to scale up to other businesses? So I think all of you have kind of expressed a lot of points which I had in mind. But nevertheless, first I want to just share a quick small snippet. I remember in the 90s, uh, the first time uh, they would launch CLO, which was a pretty long car, and an architect bought it and took it to the side. You know, he said, "Ab mujhe sharam nahi aati yahan pe side pe aane mein, because meri gaadi contractor ke gaadi jitni badi ho gayi." So, you know, that was the story of an architect until the 90s. And uh, the problem with architecture and architecture business—I mean, my story is a bit different from yours. Uh, we are a medium-sized office, not uh, you know, 2,000 uh, employee, and that's 
uh, you know, hats off to your achievement there. And I think the problem is, firstly, we are ill-equipped. Secondly, we learn by doing. So it takes that much more time. We learn at each step, commit uh, financial mistakes, commit uh, managerial mistakes, commit administrative. Because you know, at the heart of it, uh, an architect has two souls. One is the creative one, and one is the very, very, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, oppressed soul, which is the uh, commercial soul. So there's always a fight going on between these two. So, uh, you know, this guy is trying to learn slowly as he goes along. Uh, and an architect, uh, you know, always devotes more time to his core strength, which is uh, design by nature. You know, that's what he does. However, I think one of the, which Lipika quite uh, aptly put, one of the big problems uh, with the whole profession is that this is not even a part of the imagination. This is not even a part of the academia. This is not even a part of, and even currently, I mean, I'm surprised to see that what we learned 20 years back hasn't changed that much even after this whole culture of globalization, whole culture of liberalization, whole culture of startup has emerged all around architects, but nothing changes in the academia. Young people are still not being exposed to this very important aspect of doing business, learning business, because you know, there is a huge amount of creativity, huge amount of innovation out there. So I think that's really the way to go. And somehow, as I've been mentioned, we all should work together and uh, I would add to that, we've all been victims to COA diktats. So, uh, you know, I had a private limited company, uh, which was uh, uh, in the line of fire for uh, almost last five years. So I've had to convert to a private uh, a partnership. So all kind of, you know, you lose so much time, so much energy in doing, uh, in actually doing things. You're downgrading yourself. You're not growing up. Yeah, exactly. It's a shame. Uh, I will. Thank you, thank you, all four of you for sharing view, your views. I will now just put up a few points which, which, are, which are very, very relevant in today's day and age. Most people are not able to put it across on platforms. So I begin with myself where I'm not a qualified architect, not a qualified designer. I've never gone through a day of professional design schooling anywhere in my life. I've done my diploma in mechanical engineering. I don't know how the business got into me of design, but we grew from where we were trading in furniture, to manufacturing, to interiors, turnkey interiors, architecture, master planning. We grew through a period of time to about 1,600 employees. And somewhere, somewhere uh, in the year 2006, I got frustrated. Because in 96, when I had begun my career, people like G2 in Bangalore, Embassy Builders, we did his first office, Berman Irani, Rustamji Builders, Rashesh Kanakya, Kanakya Builders, Vicky Oberoi, all these are geniuses who have achieved a brand and name for themselves and created mammoth organizations. But when I would compare in that time our balance sheet to their balance sheet, we were somewhere at about 200 crores those days and they were into thousands of crores. I began to realize that there is a void. Why am I not able to upscale the design practice no matter what I did, no matter how big a project we pitched for, we were not able to really grow it up beyond that 200, 220 crores. Hence, I decided to get out of turnkey interiors and commercial architectural practice and get into other lines of business because I realized I'm the one who's guiding the builders. I'm the one who's actually making their business plans, designing it. Also, they're using my brand to market it. Why don't I do it for myself? That's how we went into hospitality. And I could relate to the previous presentation when she was talking about problems in hospitality. And when you have global firms and even large Indian practices not really understanding the nuances of hospitality design. We set up our own resort. We set up our real estate business. Using design thinking methodologies, we set up an adventure park because adventure business was non-existent in the country. Every ride in that park we designed ourselves. And today we are into six different businesses. but. The reason for stepping out of design, even though at heart I love designing and commercially not practicing design, has been the following. I saw large, the largest of design practices in India. I used to work as a contractor for Hafiz. I've supplied, supplied furniture to Hafiz for ILFS. I've, I've worked as a contractor for most of the leading architectural practices. That gave me an insight from a different point of view, which most architecture and design students would not get to learn. I soon began to analyze that each of these practices are 20 people, 50 people. 50 people is a large practice. And yet I would see them not being able to grow, not being able to scale up. Compare it to global practices, 
Sir Norman Foster's practice in, 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 in uh, UK, and you compare it to our largest Indian architects, with all due respect to them, they are not able to scale up their practices. Some of the nuances, yes, are at the root cause of the problem, the Council of Architecture, and I'm sure people will do things in a positive direction to address those issues. Still, it also translates into the academic qualification, inadequacies in academic qualification, no management training, no training of presentations. So today, if you meet fresh architects who are straight out of the best of colleges, they are not able to present themselves. They're not able to present their projects and cases, hence not able to sell and get into larger, larger projects. They're not able to manage, they have no clue of how to do human resource management. And today, human resource management is a huge skill set that one needs to acquire. As an entrepreneur, you will never be successful. Your people make your organizations. In an architecture or a design practice, the, because there is no seed capital required, the minute your senior designer learns enough from you, he poaches onto your own clients and sets up his own practice. And hence, it becomes half your fees. And then half your fees, half his fees becomes quarter of his fees by his senior and quarter of his fees becomes 10% of the fees to a point where you are pitching on a project. You will not be able to pay even your draftsman salaries. But people still pick on jobs, clients still give jobs. There is no parity. This doesn't happen in engineering. This doesn't happen in other professions. You do not go to a heart surgeon because he's the cheapest. But you go to a heart surgeon because he's reputed, because he's charging what he's charging with the finest hospital. Unfortunately, lawyers, Unfortunately, in architecture, turnkey interiors, how much per square feet, mass housing. I have, I have pitched on projects in Karnal, Agra, I don't know, across the length and breadth of the country. How much are you charging? How much is he charging? And people are giving awarded jobs not on anything else besides fees. Hence, some of our leading architectural practices, who are all friends of mine, have become drafting institutions. We talk of creativity. How do you expect an architect to give you his creative juices or his creative time when the fees being paid on the project are so meager that he can barely survive to pay his salaries? I've seen architecture practices downsize left, right, and center. And I'm talking of good architects because they are not able to commercially and financially sustain. So there are, there are these issues at the heart of it. Another, another very major issue is architectural practices do not, and creativity do not run, unlike globally, on design thinking principles and design processes. They run on individual whims and fancies and individual trial and error that you mentioned, they learn on the job. Global practices are able to scale up because they are not person dependent, they are process dependent. Sir, so you have seen generations of architects. How many architectural practices and design practices do you think really work in India on design thinking principles and their designs are process oriented and not people oriented. We have now around uh, uh, around roughly around 90,000 architects in this country. Uh, latest count under the Council of uh, got to be practiced as a got to register with the Council of Architecture. Uh, and that's increasing at now number of architecture school has increased from 20 or 30, maybe around 20 years back, and it has gone to a number of 500 or 600 architecture schools. Can you believe the phenomenal amount of growth of all these schools over there? And one of the major problems is these education institutions themselves, which has mushroomed from 20 number all over the country to around 600 number, most of them don't even have the, excepting for the top, maybe around 20 or 30 architectural schools of which we can be proud of, best possible studios and best possible exposure on all dimensions there. We don't have that. So you have a, one of the major comments, very rightly said by Abhij, is on the uh, institutions themselves, how they got to co get in new dimensions we brought in is a point very rightly brought by Abhilad. I think, I, excepting maybe around 25 to 30 of the uh, leading companies which have reasonably good amount of right managerial uh, capabilities in terms of not only creative ability, phenomenal creative ability, and, and that I got to salute. And many of them have in a very large way, and Indiana is only very recently that because jobs are all gone out abro abroad, no growth happening. All those big companies are coming to India where all the growth is happening. That's why you have all the big companies are opened there, obvious over there. But if you see each one of those companies, uh, Singapore based or London based or 
New York based or even Taiwan based or Hong Kong based architects practicing over here, you'll see a very, very strong enterprise system over there, multidisciplinary in nature and also able to have the right level of fees coming uh, on that. Since you talked about the fees, I want to just make a mention uh, because it's important, it's a raw, raw point for everybody. They don't talk about that. It was actually, uh, even though it was not our job, I was in Hutco and me and along with my predecessor earlier, SK Sharma and me, we were the one who said that if architectural professionals to give these deliverables to come over there, identified all those deliverables uh, clearly identified and then the minimum fees shall be not lower than so much for a residential or a commercial or various types of projects over there you know then later on coa tried to take that iaa also tried to bring that but unfortunately that's only on paper i'm talking about the mid 80s and the mid 90s uh, where we got in a lot of flack there the, the benchmark was put over there. But if you pay that, these are the type of deliverables. So if you care only half of that, then deliverables will be lower. You don't get into the so much amount of uh, issues coming on that. So th that's also another area we'll have to get into it. But I think I entirely agree with you that when, uh, when the teams go into uh, such growth stories, I think they should be part of the built environment in its fullest sense. I would put architect as a center one. They can link with each other and say, this is a product I made. I made, not designed. Like you said, I'm part of that particular thing. Then it can only happen, as I've been said over there, you're able to have a full-scale involvement in the particular thing, not only the comprehensive designing, detailing, including the, the estimating or the quantity surveying, even the big role to play in the MEPF related work. You might, you might get those specialization. These are all specialization areas coming on that. But if you're able to have a good link on that and put them also in the right place, very briefly, you talked about the builder's one. I'm talking on average or not the Bombay model. Say, if you have 10,000 rupees a square feet for the whole pro, uh, yeah, yeah, flat being sold, is 30,000, 40,000 in Mumbai, that's different. So if you do that, I'm just trying to break down. Co cost of construction will be off the order of maybe around 4,000 to 3,000 to 5,000, with the best possible finishes and so over there. And can you imagine that the architectural service, you are not being paid even 10 to 20 rupees a square feet. 20 rupees a square feet is all that you pay for a product which is around 10,000 rupees a square feet being sold. Whereas, if you are able to get the project management consultants dealing with that, they get into the 100 and 200 over there. Facility managers are getting more. So you've got to really have an introspection coming in that. Like what he said, engineering is going. Structural engineering is going in a phenomenally large way, very large way. That's, that's why even the downturn time, he could grow in a uh, very big way and got into diverse way from building to large number of other structures also in large way. And, I, and that's an important component, very rightly brought up. So the answer lies in getting into some of those, but I know there are some areas on which uh, the profession practice under the Architects Act and the Council of Architecture, uh, they are not permitting that, but you got to see how we can work it out on those areas. But According to me, the architectural profession who is going, the, the one who is conceptualizing, who is comprehensive design in a three-dimensional space, and from buildings to the infrastructure, the built environment as a whole, if the contribution is phenomenal. The way in which, at present, Indian, uh, uh, Indian uh, uh, built environment groups are associating them is not the way it should have been. Optimally to be utilized, and then you'll be paid rightly, and then professional will get the right position that I don't think they're getting the right position. You'll be shocked to know, sir, you, you know, I, I deal with the all country. I had a three-day three, three day program, municipality which ended yesterday, evening only. We had around 1,500 delegates, 300 cities. You'll be surprised none of the municipal corporations or municipalities have even one architect there. Only in one it is there. Planner is not there. And therefore, you have them, they should all come into this particular thing in the, in the built, and I'm very happy to hear that in the metro projects, they are now coming in an increase, increase in transportation structure, airport structures, port structures, uh, etc. You've got to get in beyond building structure alone. So therefore, there are a lot of areas into which also we have to diversify and get into that into a large way. So thank you for your, for your views. I think they are very, very valuable. I would like to wrap up by asking the questions what is that piece of advice that you give to the crowd sitting here with your ups and downs that you've seen in your career? How does one scale up their design practices, make it commercially viable? What are those few tips that you would like to give people? We all understand 
design processes are the only ones that are going to help people to scale up their practice or else it's not going to be possible. But making things more relevant from your years of experience, what is it that you advise them? Well, uh, to begin with, I'm not of the opinion that uh, design processes or some kind of defined uh, design thinking, if one is following, only then one can uh, succeed. To me, a designer, an architect, or anybody creative is somebody who cannot be uh, you know, treated like a per square foot situation. You can't treat an architect or a designer uh, and, and like a bag of cement. The designers and the creative people actually uh, have to have work in a different kind of a space. And therefore, your question about scalability all depends on the professional's aspiration levels. Now, everybody does not need to be aspiring to become uh, Abin, for instance, with a 2,000 uh, manpower uh, you know, set of people. Or uh, somebody who just a, a hugely popular young architect who had um, a fantastic presentation just a while ago, hugely popular among all, all the designers, Chris, uh, who uh, has only three or four people and has it so small that his creativity is so pronounced in everything and anything that he does. So it all depends on the aspiration levels of what you really uh, want to uh, you know, achieve at the end of your career. So it is, is it only about scalability, which means loads of people, lots of money, lots of people to handle, and some Sometimes not even a lot of money because by the time if you see the whole scenario of things and you have to pay so many people their salaries and everything else put together, different departments to deal with, admin, HR, accounts and so on and so forth. Really, what are you really uh, ending up as? Are you ending up being a creative person who has enough time to focus on the creativities that you're set out for or your clients are hiring you for? Are you just sit, walking into the office, giving your five minutes of creative juices flowing and the rest of the 95 minutes, all you're doing, 90% is that managing an entire huge setup. So it is really a personal choice. For me, I have gone through this entire journey where I started with just four people in my garage room and then moved on to doing large scale design projects, had about 40 people in my design team, went on to doing manufacturing. I had a 10,000 square feet uh, manufacturing furniture unit in uh, Tuglagabad at that time and I was happy doing all those furniture 2008, 9 with the recession and of course with all the advent of Chinese furniture and uh, Malaysian furniture coming in, I have wrapped up all of that and gone back into doing uh, and running a boutique practice. So with my th almost 28, 30 years of experience, teaches, what has it taught me? It has taught me one very important thing, a very important lesson is if you are good at your work, if you are good with your creativities, people will seek you out. And as Chris said, the high point of being able to refuse a project is really very, very uh, rewarding. And if you can refuse a project and say, no, I will only concentrate on the things that I have to do, it can be very, uh, very, uh, you know, uh, you know, you can create a, s a space where you can actually focus on the creativity and brand yourself and make a name and then call your shots in terms of asking for your design fee and nobody will refuse. You will be sought, off, sought out, trust me. So it all, it's all about, uh, you know, what you want to do and which path do you want to travel. Because as I hear, Abin, as I hear uh, some of you uh, guys and Jimmy and others, uh, their uh, architectural practice or design practice may not have fetched them so much as their parallel activities, which are the engineering practices and other practices, or the PMC, uh, which have actually fetched them the, the, the larger pie, uh, you know, the piece of the pie. So I think it's uh, very, very individual, uh, and it's a choice that all of you have to make. Thank you, Lipika. Uh, let me share, let me share uh, why do I keep insisting on processes, and specifically if they are larger firms. So there is Thomas Heatherwick, Heatherwick Studios in London. If you Google up this man, he designs everything from greeting cards to he's one of the most sought after designers in the world. The opening and closing ceremonies of Beijing Olympics was done by Danny Boyle. Thomas Heatherwick was a part and parcel of that. The Olympic quadrant was designed by Thomas. The buses in the city of London are designed by Thomas. When I went to the studio, I was utterly surprised. The methodology of working, every product is unique, every project is unique, but 
the reason why he is able to do across the world from New York to London to whatever projects he is doing in Southeast Asia and China. Every project is unique. The Shanghai World Expo, the best architectural design out of 160 countries was given to the UK Pavilion. Why? If you decipher the DNA, why? It was purely because of the design processes set up by him within his design institution and organization. That is why they are able to go anywhere in the world. Museum in Abu Dhabi. I can name his projects after projects. His exhibition at VNA was a 600 page book of projects designed by this man. He's not a qualified architect, he's a furniture designer. But because of very strong design processes. So you spoke about Sir Norman Foster's office. So very interesting, in India it doesn't happen. Usually, two architects of the same practice do not collaborate and work on the same job. Most of them, uh, there are exceptions, but two interior designers don't work on the same job. You were talking of multidisciplinary specialization, doesn't happen in India. But I know of projects where Sir Norman Foster's office hires Thomas Heatherwick's team to work on a particular project. I mean, that is the kind of collaboration that will change the future in India. Because like Abhin said, you will get multidisciplinary specialization onto the table. And believe you me, no matter small boutique firms or large practices, everybody has that something special that somebody brings on the table. And when you collaborate and work together, it works just fine. Okay, so whilst closing, Abhin, tell me, what is your advice to the people sitting here? If they were to scale up their practices, what is it that they should do? And how should they go about doing it? So, um, firstly, I would like to tell you that whatever scale at which you wish to work, right, is a great scale, you know? Because at the end of the day, an architect aspires to do fulfilling work. Whatever fulfills you, is good for you and great for you. But I'd like to leave one thought with you. You know, it is not as much about designing a product, but it is also about designing your office, which helps the product to come out better. So the reason why I thought this subject was interesting for all of us is that we could probably put on the table, you know, ideas about how you can design your office. We always sit in all these meetings and discuss beautiful products or how one particular journey to that beautiful product took place. We do not sit down and discuss how we structured our business to achieve creativity. How did we make a studio which motivated people to achieve creativity? I'll, leave, I'll take, take you through one interesting thought. I mentioned to you that I worked with great masters. You know, I must confess to you, I was, um, let's say, a little blue-eyed boy of Mr. Stein when I was working in his office. You know, I enjoyed working with these people. But I had a small criticism. These masters, they got the best architects from the best schools. You know, like Mr. Rajendra Dongre, you know? Uh, toppers from their, universe, uh, their schools, they all came to work with the masters. And what did the masters do? instead of making those people use their creativity. Why were they toppers? Not because they were good at drafting, not because they knew detailing, they just come out of school. They were toppers because of their thinking. They were actually very creative architects. But whenever these people came and worked with the masters, they were made to draft, and they were made to design in the language of the masters. So I designed in the language of Mr. Stein, and I was very proud to do so and to understand him. But after two and a half or three years, the love I had for him, in spite of that, I felt that I would do myself a service by stepping out and rethinking how you design the profession itself, the practice itself. So I thought, instead of having a practice where, you know, I myself am the designer and I enjoy being Mr. Abhin Adam Shindani architect, why don't I have an office where I have a product which the client wants, a brand, not just my brand, I have to reinforce my client's brand. Style, I don't want to have a single style because I don't want to be trapped in style. I want to actually understand my client and I am after all just a medium to actually translate the client's vision of his project on the earth, taking into account the sustainable concepts, okay, and the entire environment around it. To do so, I needed to get the best of the people who work with me. 
I need it, if a person is good at creative thinking, I needed his creative thinking. An experienced uh, architect or engineer, I needed his detailing. And I needed to bring all of them in the table, not just architects, but poets, philosophers, uh, you know, professionals, clients. And that was the way, the first time I came to India, I wrote Stoop Design Forum. I called it a design forum. I didn't want architects. I wanted everyone to sit across a table and design a project together. And so both these businesses, my architecture business, which is a small, uh, you know, niche business, I do only very, very special projects, which like, you know, give me a lot of satisfaction. And at the same time, the engineering business, which allows me to intervene at the scale of a foster. The issue is also, I want to tell you, when you say that you don't want to intervene at a scale, you know, an architect basically has a problem solving creative mind. You know, and he walks around, and you know, in India, we design a beautiful building, but nobody cares about the street around you or the city in which this building exists. As a concerned citizen, I have comments about what the city should be like, but will I be able to intervene at the level of the city in my whole life if I think only about six people and a small organization? No, if I want to intervene, maybe I have to make an organizational structure either myself with a group of architects to make a great collaborative as uh, you know, was suggested here, or okay, by making my own practice that way. That's what's interesting. And for, for young architects, for architects starting out, what I'd like to say is that if we were taught all this, like I'll tell you, I took the trouble. I finished, I've done philosophy, by the way. I've done architecture, my master's is in aesthetics and philosophy. But when I came down to India, I decided to say, do something totally different. I went and did management, okay? And then I, then I joined uh, my company so that I could kind of have an all-round view and take a kind of an all-round approach. Just some of my thoughts, thank you. Guys, those thoughts were really, really nice. And as a lot of learning from whatever he said, I wish, I wish people can apply it. Anupam Bansal, I, I want to put you in a spot. Let's say tomorrow morning you've been appointed as a chairman of the Council of Architecture. <laughs> he can, of course, of course he can and he should. So, if you are at the helm of affairs, we all realize a, a formal body can do a long-term change and bring about this desperate change that we are all seeking. What is it that you will do, five steps that you will do to change the way architectural and interior design practices are paid, the way design is respected, and the way design is taught in this country? That's a tough one. And uh, you know, I have to openly say things which are maybe not very pleasing to all of you. But uh, firstly, I think maybe we should uh, increase our representation in the parliament. There's no architect's lobby in the parliament, nobody to argue on behalf of uh, architects. There's a big lawyer's lobby and can can get GST waived off. But architects, you know, we get, you know, everything against us. So first thing is to somehow motivate younger architects, not only to become architects, but maybe why not become parliamentarians. They have a great sense of society. They have a great sense of public good. I mean, that's something which is inherent in architectural education. And like Pilu Modi, exactly. Secondly, I think uh, somehow we have to get the Architects Act to be, you know, it was made in 1972. And you can imagine the time it was made and hasn't been amended for the last 50 years. There's been no consideration of how the country has moved from doing, for architects, projects of maybe one crore, maybe 50 lakhs, to 5,000, 20,000 crore. So the whole rules of the game have entirely changed. So the Architects Act needs to be made much more business friendly in that sense, much more compliant, Institutional. institutionalized. And I think the most important thing, which we've had conversations with lots of people, but uh, and I, I believe there is also a, a kind of an amendment pending, where at least LLPs are being allowed. And uh, you know, some limited liability partnerships will be allowed to practice as architecture firm. But the most important thing, I think, which as architects we can really argue on, is not the square foot, not this kind of undercutting bit. Can we not devise a fee structure based on slabs of projects? So, you know, if you have a 100 crore project, you get fee until a certain percentage. You 100 to 
uh, maybe 300 uh, crore projects, you get a fee of a certain percentage. And beyond that, you get a certain percentage. So I think that would really uh, you, you know, resolve this whole issue of uh, government first learning from private sector, private sector then looking at the government saying they're, they're able to enforce such low fees, why can't we enforce lower fees? So it's become like a, you know, a football match between these two and you know, we are kind of becoming spectators in the whole game. So that would be my most important uh, uh, you know, kind of reform if I could bring that ever in. Yes, architects implementing technology for their offices because without that you can't really grow practice or can't design in today's day and age. Okay, I guess it's been a good session and I guess there's been a lot of takeaways. I'm sure some of you might have questions. I don't know how much time we've left, but we can quickly take one or two questions to be addressed to any of us sitting across here. Can we have a microphone there? Okay, we've got five more minutes, so we can take five questions. Hi. Uh Good morning. My, name, my question is to Mr. Abin. Sir, you talked about how you grew your practice and uh, how you're, you were able to really scale up uh, doing architecture as well as MAP and maybe you know structural consultancy as well. So, uh, you talked about working with masters, then coming back, acquiring a management degree, acquiring those skills which were needed to really scale up your business and and evolve your thinking from just being a designer to also being a successful business person. So do you think now there is a need to change the curriculum of how architecture is taught at the school level and not just teach them how to design, how to detail out, but also teach them a bit about strategy, management, maybe introduce a bit of finance so that tomorrow they can become practitioners, they can run successful businesses and and even if they don't want to do architecture, then they end up, you know, doing some other business, but they get equipped with those skills. So do you think that architectural education needs a relook in that sense? Yeah, um, well, that's a, that's a very, very, very pertinent point. You know, one of the things I always admire, okay, is that we have a very good example like Pilu Modi in Ratan Tata. You know, after all, here's an architect. He's running the entire Tata enterprise. What this, you know, what education did he receive to become, okay, someone who's running the Tata enterprise? I believe the same problem solving skills that you learned in your architecture college, if you apply them to life, you will have already started on that step of education. After all, in five years, there's about this much education that you can get. It's how aware you are and how you apply your knowledge that is most important. I, you know the way I work, because I've had an architectural education, I'm able to actually give some orientation to engineers. I'll give you an example, right? When you design a rail line, okay? My company is famous for designing bridges, but we are doing 1,000 kilometers of India's railway right now, including all the railway stations, uh, workshops, the housing, okay, and as well as the track. But when my engineers are working and when people are asked that, you know, fees, you know, you get, uh, you know, uh, there's a huge pressure on fees, a lot of competition in the industry, etc. I tell them, you know what really costs money in a rail line? It's actually the earth embankment. Nobody thinks of that. It isn't all that glorious engineering of all the bridges. The amount of earth that you have to make for putting those tracks right and the embankment you created what is actually out of the 5000 crores that tatas are putting into it 4500 crores is in all that so if you can reduce the earth by 10 centimeters and show the client that okay you more than made up your fee which means you look at something like value you know you know delivering value if you as an architect are looking through your problem solving mind at delivering value right and if you tell all your people that think every day what value you're giving a client. When I walk to my client's site, before I go, I say I'm going to save 50 lakhs to a crore of his money through my visit. And then you know what I do? I charge one lakh per visit. Then he pays for it. He's looking forward to meeting me. And actually, I don't go till I have that idea. So I, he wants me to come and he's willing to pay that money because he knows when I walk through his site, Okay, I am going to come with an idea and I'm up, I've done my homework, I've studied the project and I said, oh, this is the project, actually if we did this, we'll save money. So you have to have that problem solving mind, it's not just education, it's how you apply the knowledge you have 
in everything. An architect actually is fantastic because he learns how to do an hospital. So when he meets the guy who's designing a hospital, he understands about you know health. You know, he learns by doing IT, he understands about IT. How aware you are and how you're not thinking in the box but out of the box is very important. With that, it's, it's the best education you can have. I'll just share with you something that changed my life and my way of thinking design. 2008, I attended a session with IDEO. IDEO taught us design thinking and design thinking processes. So whatever realization that entire session taught me in a couple of days, the problem solving attitude, the innovation that a designer architect can bring across on the table, because as a designer, you're constantly problem solving. Only thing you need to do is consciously do it with a process and the entire thing changes. I would strongly advise each and every one of you to go down to IDEO, understand what a legendary institution and what their design thinking at Stanford has given to this world. Today, management departments across large organizations have design thinking as a discipline like HR and finance. That is what an architect or a designer can bring across on the table. Any other questions? Yeah, please do. Yeah, hi. A uh, lot of great ideas there. Uh, Lipika said, do what you like and do it well and money and people will come to you. That's for the 1% people. Charles Correa, how about all of us who just want to make a living, right? Jimmy Mistry did, did a great thing that they don't teach management in, in design, so I just became a contractor. How about all of us who want to make a living out of architecture, right? I liked what Anupam said that, you know, we need more people to get into parliament and stuff. I also don't agree with the one lakh uh, uh, per visit thing. The concept of selling uh, your fees or your services as the money saving idea went down the drain with the internet. That was great in the 90s. What I'm missing out here is the simple one thing that makes all Indian architectural passes, uh, practices fail or not do well or make you depend on the wife doing government job or contracting and other things which can't be said here. And all American practices, or Western even, uh, Chinese and Singaporean practices succeed. One simple thing, simple dhande ki baat, they count man hours. They count the man hours expended, and they bill man hours. The moment we do this, all problems will stop. It's a good suggestion. We should look at it. And, and unless and until there is a law that enforces it, it becomes very, very difficult. But yeah, it is, it is one of the things that can be done. A lot of international practices globally, even internally within their organizations, bill in man hours. I know of international design practices like Callison, HOK, they do that at back end. Any other questions? It's a, it's a very valid suggestion and we thank you for it. Any other questions? Yeah, please do. One last question, I think. There's a lady and then there's a man. Okay, can we have the microphone there? Hello. I uh, very well endorse uh, the suggestion given by Mr. Anupam. Uh, again, I, I repeat, I endorse this uh, statement that uh, representation in the parliament is a must. Can you, can you beat it? There were other, the, other, the other day, there was a um, uh, reference that all the film industry people, all the people from uh, media, all the people from, you know, different walks of life, they should have a very solid representation and we are, in, uh, you know, in, in masses are suffering because of uh, and, uh, when all the non-technical people talking technical thing and technical people talking non-technical thing kind of thing. You see, I mean, represent, uh, representation is the only solution, I think so. So point, again, what Anupam said is absolutely perfect. Representation should be there, but there is precious little we can do right now about it. However, I firmly believe our Prime Minister Narendra Modi's scheme of make in India. Make in India dream can only be achieved if we design in India. And if that is not done, you will be yet another labor-oriented outsourced manufacturing hub used by the world. But the minute you design in India, automatically you'll end up manufacturing in India and you'll be self-sustainable. And make in India dream would be really, really well achieved. I guess we need to end the session with that note. And I hope you all have enjoyed the session just as much as I've enjoyed moderating it. And uh, I thank FOID for getting me here to moderate the session. It has been time worth spent. Uh, 
yes, it's, it's, a, it's a topic that we discuss behind closed doors. But it's the first time with his years of experience, uh, he says that it's been discussed on a public forum. I thank you all and thank FYID for getting us here. I thank all my panelists for having traveled from out of town and within town, giving their precious time to, for the betterment of the fraternity and its future. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed to all the panelists and thank you to you for a beautifully moderating session. While well, I would request all of you to remain on the stage, I'd like to firstly invite Mr. Rahul Jindal from Loomcraft to please come forward and present a token of gratitude to our first set of speakers. May I please request Mr. Rahul Jindal to present the memento firstly to Mr. Anupam Bansal. present a token of gratitude, firstly, to Mr. V. Suresh. Thank you very much. May we request our panelists to please come together for a group photograph as well. 